Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the lecture four of Deep Learning for NLP. So let's get started. So um, today's outline will be starting with a few announcements and then, uh, yeah, by the way, let me know if you can hear me. And then um, we'll briefly recap what we went over last week um, RNN, recurrent neural net. And then um, let's go into what it means to train a neural net. And what that means is that um, basically we're optimizing neural network for some objective. Then we will be covering um, one of the uh, most prominent methods to do this, which is uh, gradient descent. And then uh, I'll briefly talk about backpropagation and the um, how it works briefly. Then uh, number six, uh, we'll be briefly talking about what it means to have uh, gradients in RNNs explode or vanish. And then um, for the uh, solution to this, um, I'll talk about the uh, long short term memory, LSTM and um, probably a bit about why I'll stand, but um, this will be mostly homework though in the assignment. Um, so I'll be talking about the, um, the um, disadvantage of RNNs in the lecture and the assignment will be on uh, analyzing why, one of the, um, one of the problems as assignments will be on analyzing why um, LSTMs are better than RNNs in a, a mathematical manner. Then briefly about dropout. So up to um, up to this part, when we are finished with dropout, you probably know everything you need to um, start the assignment. Assignment um, will be um, released today, and the um, I'll be uh, briefly going over the Jupyter notebook, how to um, do some PyTorch programming. Although um, you are actually expected to know PyTorch, but um, I'll try to go over that um, um, basically equivalent to what we have done until now uh, during lectures one through four. So yeah, announcement again. So the um, coding assignment uh, one will be released tonight on the class website. And the assignment will consist of um, some math questions about the LSTMs and um, PyTorch coding for text classification. So you will be asked to create a model that can do um, sentiment classification well on English data set. Uh, it's called STEM for Sentiment Tree Bank. And this will be due in uh, two weeks. So March 29th. Oh, could you please mute if you are not? Yeah, make sure if you're muted. Okay, so let's go to the uh, recap of recurrent neural network. So um, last week we talked about what it means to be recurrent of a single neural net. So when we are saying a neural net is recurrent, we are reusing its parameters in the same manner over um, different inputs. Usually these different inputs is a sequence of um, um, some input tokens. So let's say we're given, um, like say, uh, three tokens here, as you see. We have three tokens. Then um, the important part is that uh, we have different inputs to do this module, but we are using the same parameters and same um, uh, way of transforming these inputs to the outputs. So. Um, that's why um, the output t minus one is um, here. It's like the simplest form of RNN. This will be basically um, actually I'll compute the ht minus one instead. So um, ht minus one will be just simply um, v over h 
I will say zero um, plus u of um, um, x t minus one plus um, some bias, right? And although we have different input and different previous hidden state, we will compute the new hidden state in the same way if this is recurrent. So h t is equal to we use same v but different h. Um, same u, but different x, and same b. So that's the point of um, what it means to have a recurrency in your network. And we talked about why we need some activation. Uh, the reason is that if we just do um, linear transformation, linear transformation on top of linear transformation is only just linear transformation. So you cannot model anything complicated. Um, you cannot basically um, model anything that's not linear, uh, the relationship between the input and the output. So, but the functions that we're trying to model in, um, in the real world mostly is nonlinear. So we need to inject some nonlinearity inside uh, the RNN. And that's how we do. Um, we talked about using ReLU instead, and uh, uh, we talked about why this is not a good idea in general. So uh, most of the times when we are dealing with RNNs, we use 10H. So previous in the previous slide, I said that HT equal to V HT minus one plus UXT plus B. So if we write this again here, um, the original RNN is basically, um, which one was it? V HT, v HT minus one plus UXT um, plus B where the V, U, V are the training parameters. But instead, we've transformed this into, uh, by adding the nonlinearity in the RNN, we put um, 10H. 10H is either um, described as 10H or we use, sometimes use sigma. So I'll just use sigma for here, um, just for gravity. Exactly, that's right. So it's very simple um, transformation we're adding to the RNN, but this is very important to make the um, neural net um, appropriate for nonlinear relationship between the input and the output. Okay, so that was the recap. And then also we talked about the um, exploding and vanishing gradient problem. So, um, and that's because um, the um, how they actually um, operate uh, is that if we just do some math, uh, I'll be going through this uh, soon, but then we'll see that there is uh, some issue with the uh, doing training time. So, but then we need to first define what it means to train, right? So that's what we're gonna do. Um, so that's why we have the motivation for the LSTM and GRU, um, which were uh, discovered or proposed in 1997 and 2014, uh, respectively. So before going into the um, exploding and vanishing gradient problem, let's get into what it means to train a neural net. So here's really important um, clarification that I saw many um, students get confused about, which is that uh, neural net actually has two important components, input data and parameters. And these sh two should not be confused. Um, so during inference, a neural network is just a multivariate function of real valued inputs with fixed model parameters. So what that means is, as you see, we are, um, we are fixing model parameters. So we have fixed this. We're saying the model parameters are fixed. Model parameters in the um, previous slides were things like U, V, B, uh, W. These were the um, common notation you, you would use to refer to the model parameters. So during inference, these parameters are fixed. But wait, how? turn on the chat just in case. 
If you have a question, ask me anytime, please. So in the inference time, these parameters are fixed. But of course, you're getting a new input every time because of inference. So an example is, let's say this was a text cl classification problem, then X is a text. And theta are the uh, real number parameters that we have learned already during inference, after training, of course. So these are fixed. So you have function of uh, X and other things are not variable. But during training, it's the, exactly the opposite way that the neural network can be considered as a function of its model parameters with fixed inputs, which is training data. So here, theta is no more fixed, but it's something that we vary, but we have fixed the X. So do you see the difference here? That's really important difference that um, uh, many students actually get confused. So what does it mean to train then is that we're fixing the training data and we want to find theta, the parameters that best guess the um, outputs. So here's the, uh, the really the important part. The training is just a process of finding the parameters that guesses the output well. If you put this more formally, then maximizing the likelihood of the training input given the parameters. So what does that mean? So we are saying that we're given y equal f of theta and x equal to some fixed value of training data. And then we can define the probability distribution given this model. So we have done this, right? Uh, you may remember that in order to make a model into a probabilistic model, we, um, we use the uh, softmax and other terms um, to really conveniently describe it with some probabilistic uh, properties. So let's, um, uh, so let me give an example. So what that means is that, so given y equal f theta x equal x, this is um, the, the final function you, that you want to create. So here, y will be, if, let's say we're doing text classification, then um, here the y will be more of a label of the text. In the sentiment classification task, this will be either um, positive or negative. And theta will be just uh, values, real number values that you want to optimize with. And x will be the exact text that we're putting into the function, things like um, some movie review, right? But when you are transforming this into a probabilistic distribution, it becomes a bit different because now you need to formally define what's the probability of the uh, function being or the output being positive and negative. And we need to assign these um, stuff, these numbers, and these numbers should sum up to one. And of course they have to be between zero and one. That's why we had to use this uh, softmax to make into positive distribution. So the point here is that once you define a model, the model will be y equal f theta uh, and x equal x. Inside this model, um, a part of this model will be probabilistic model. And you will have something on top of the probabilistic model to get the final output right. So in this case, then what will be what will be the uh, uh, one additional model that you need will need to add on top of this probabilistic model to get the output. So you're given, let's say you created model to define um, x equal x given theta, then this will be just um, basically just two values, right? This will be just a uh, vector of two values one corresponding to positive, something like 0 0.3, and one corresponding to negative, 0 0.7, a vector of two values. 
then you will need to do something like argmax, right? Wait, sorry. So, oh no, no, sorry, not argmax x. My bad. So when you're doing argmax of this probability, then you are, you will be, in this case, the argmax will be i equal one instead of zero, right? Because 0 0.7 is bigger than 0 0.3. So this will be um, one, and maybe you will have another model that translate this into the positive or negative, a simple model. So now you get the, hopefully get the point that the, there is no, um, the, there is no difference between, um, there is no, I'll say fundamental difference between the y equal f uh, as a function and defining that as a positive model. The only difference, okay. Yeah, so I don't have the slides actually yet on the web. Sorry about that, I forgot to upload it. So, but um, if you need that, actually, I forgot about that. I'll do that right now. That's not too hard um, because I can just give you a link here and then I'll update the homepage later. Just a second. Oh my gosh. So I'm posting on the chat right now. Let me know if you can access it. Okay, sounds great. All right, let's go back to lecture. Okay, so what I want to say here is that um, when you're designing a neural network, always think of it as a power testing model first so that you will have an output of the power testing distribution that you're trying to um, create a model for. And then you'll use this power testing distribution and do something like ArcMax. The simplest thing is argmax, right? To get the final output, that will be your um, inference routine. But when you're doing anything related to training, you will use probabilistic distribution to actually train the model. So that's one thing that you need to remember. Because I think this was another point that I think a lot of uh, students get confused between. What, why are we defining probabilistic distribution when we're giving y equal f? And the reason is because uh, defining as probabilistic distribution is much easier to train a model than using the uh, 
the y equal f directly. So this was a probability for one instance of the training data, right? So we're given input text x, and then we have computed, given that single text, what would be the probability of that text being positive or negative. But what we want to do, because we have a lot of training data, and what we want to do is we want to generalize over all possible input data. So instead of just defining one probability for one example, we want to compute the joint probability for all input examples and try to maximize it. So this is what's called maximum likelihood estimation. So let's get into this. So let's go back to this, right? So here I defined what would be the probability of X given theta. So Just a second. Oh, my bad. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So here is actually one uh, really important confusion I made. Sorry. Um, so I'll actually try to write this again. My bad. I make mistakes too, just one second. So I actually wrote this wrong. Uh, just one second. Kind of mix this. Just one second. Hmm. Yeah. So I'll write this again because I I was not um I was not accurate enough here. So what I have to define is not probability of x being x given theta. Sorry about that. So I want to define what is the probability of the y being certain value um, given given two things, right? Um, theta and x equal to x, right? So that's what you want to compute. And we have two possible values of y, right? Given theta and x, theta are the uh, model parameters and x is the input. So this will be just, again, a vector of two values, let's say 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. And that's why we need one more step after this to get what the y will be. So how we can compute f is just basically we do arc max of y that maximizes this probability, right? So hopefully I'm clear now. Yeah, it's good that I've caught this mistake before the lecture ends. So it's same thing, but of course this has to be also changed. I have to put y given x equal x and comma. So this has to be, this is actually wrong. This is right. So let's say that we're given a model. We're, let's say we have fixed the model. We have fixed the theta and we have fixed the input. 
then we can compute, given that model and the input, we can compute what the probability of each possible y value will be. In this case, what the probability for the pos positive and negative will be, and it was 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. And suppose that the answer was actually not positive, but negative. That means the model currently thinks this is the answer, but actually the answer should be 0 0.3. So what, what should we do to make this model better? Simple, right? We want to alter or change the model so that the probability corresponding to negative is higher or maximized. And that's exactly why where the definition of maximum likelihood estimation comes from. We want to maximize the likelihood for the y value that we think is the answer but in the training data. But of course, this was just for a single input data, right? So if we have multiple training data input points, then of course, for the generalization in, um, in terms of statistics, we want to utilize all those input data and compute the joint probability for all input examples and maximize it. So let's again, go back to this I'm just writing the uh, the same thing, same line again. Given theta. This was for just single example. So I'll use subscript I to indicate this was example I. Then this is was for single example. So we want to compute the joint probability of all examples. We'll use the pi to indicate that. So I will be starting from one. Let's say we have n examples and we're just simply multiplying all these probabilities. So we want to find theta that maximizes this product of a lot of values. But do you see any issue with this? It looks nice. It makes sense that we want to maximize this, but there's really important problem. And that is because we are multiplying a lot of small values. And let's say this N is something like something like say 1 million. It's quite typical these days. And then it's very likely that because you're multiplying so many small values, this will be very close to zero. It will basically underflow. That's what you call when you have small, so, so small number that you cannot even recognize how large that is. So we don't want to operate in this space in this uh, probably space when we are multiplying numbers. So there is a really good tool to get, uh, get around of this problem, which is called logarithm. And what's good about logarithm? Logarithm is, uh, this is a quick reminder. Logarithm is, looks like this, right? So what's really good property of a logarithm? It's monotonically increasing function. So when you maximize a value that after logarithm, then probably that value will be also maximized too. So do you get that? Did you get that? So what that means is mathematically, what that means is that argmax z of some, a log of some value is equivalent to, wait, 
Um, Sorry. That's it. sorry about that. Is equivalent to not having logarithm at all, right? Can, how, can we, how, how can you prove this? Well, if you say there is a value that's um, bigger than so suppose that, so how can we prove that this is actually always right? So it's really simple proof actually. So suppose that this is not true, which means you could find a Z that has a, um, that has a higher value than the argmax of F set. That's like the Z, Z prime. But if you plug that Z prime into log F Z prime, you will see that if Z prime is smaller than Z, then you know that it will be bigger than um, Fz prime will be smaller than Fz, or Fz will be bigger than Fz prime, right? So it's a very simple proof. Um, it's just um, um, hopefully you can get through that. This is actually always right. The fact that uh, log is monotonically increasing function, so you can apply to this to um, any numbers, and you will always see that this will be true. So, um, so now going back to uh, just went through this property. Now going back to, we wanted to uh, maximize this, right? Find theta that max this, right? Which means then we can take, which means this is equivalent to, so, arc max theta of multiplying all these probabilities this will be equivalent to taking a log and then doing the argmax And what's nice about log, why do we use log at all? Because when you log some multiplications inside, then it will be summation. So this is exactly equivalent to summations of log probability of the same thing, where now we have translate this product into summations, right? And we will be doing two things here. One is that because the n could be changing, so it's n could be you have, basically they are the samples from the training data, right? So it's inconvenient to use this as a standard value. Instead, you want to average them so that you will be whatever the n is, you will not be you can compare them between them more easily. And number two is people just uh, for some reason we want to operate in positive space, right? But if you take logarithm of something uh, smaller than zero, uh, one, then you will be negative. So it's not super convenient. So what people do is that they try to instead um, minimize argument, minimize negative of average. This is the important thing that's been added, and of course minimize has been, uh, maximize has been replaced with minimize and the same thing, exactly the same thing, right? So you're trying to find a theta that minimizes this value. And 
That's what we usually call in training neural net loss function. And there are several ways to call this. Um, Sometimes people call it L theta. Sometimes some people use J. But whenever you see something similar to this, you're talking about loss function and you're trying to minimize this. And the reason why you're minimizing this is because when you have found a theta, or I mean, the, uh, theta is a set of values. So it's not single scalar, it's a vector or matrix or se uh, several, ma several matrices or tensors. Then you found a tensor or value that originally maximize the likelihood of our training data outputs given the training data inputs. So now you see the connections, right? So this is actually more of a deep learning basics or machine learning basics, but I know some of you are not, you haven't taken the these uh, deep learning classes. So going over this, it is really important thing that actually it's more most important thing in I think deep learning, um, one of the most important things that you know what it means to actually minimize loss. Okay. All right. So now then the question of course is then, okay, that sounds great. All right. You have defined your op uh, objective functions. So you want to find theta that minimize this function, but how can you do that? How can we find a theta that can minimize this? And you're not, we're not talking about a finite number of choices. If this, Theta was just, for instance, integer set, or I mean, some fixed number of theta could be, it's theta is in the range of a fixed number of possible values, then you can just, you know, just substitute every possible value and find what gives you a minimum. But then because theta is not finite, it's, its potential set is infinite, it's real number set, right? So, so you cannot really use that. What can we do? And the tool that we use, which is surprisingly simple, but surprisingly very, still very popular, it's pre predominantly the only way to optimize function is gradient descent. So what's the uh, motivation between, uh, what, what's the motivation behind the gradient descent. The fact that if we have a function and suppose this function is two dimensional, I mean, one, one dimensional output, one dimensional input, just like what you see in this uh, graph. And here you're seeing some parabola, but this could be some random functions too, right? Something like this. But suppose that for now, let's assume that this is a convex function. So convex, I'm not gonna define it very precisely, but you can think of as a convex function being very similar to parabola or something that's very, I'll say, um, simply simple in terms of uh, there's no like much going up and down. So in other words, when you're, uh, when you have a second degree differentiation, then um, you're, you will not have inflection points, right? Then how we can find this minimum in traditional math will be analytically, we try to find a solution, for instance, in a parabolic equation, second degree polynomial equation, which is something like, you know, a, ax squared plus bx plus c, then we know how we can find this, right? If this is, uh, if this has local minima, then we know that the, the solution will be always, when the y prime is equal to zero, which means we're saying um, zero equal to two a x plus b. So x will be always at um, minus b over two a, right? So we have an analytical solution. So if we had analytical solution for our neural net, then we don't even have to use anything like gradient descent, right? But the problem is that neural nets are oftentimes very complex that they need to, they can, they don't have analytical solutions and they need, they need something like gradient descent to find a solution. So what is gradient descent? It's simply 
you just basically just guess first your starting point. Suppose that you guessed here, this is a zero. Suppose that this is a zero. And by the way, uh, one important thing is this is another thing that I see a lot of people get confused. This is not y. This y axis is not y. It's not y. So it's not y. How would I actually say that in? No, it's not y. When you're doing the gradient descent, you're not optimizing your y value, you're optimizing your loss function. It's very, very obvious, but when you're doing, say, interviews in, uh, when you're, you know, going to companies, you're trying to get job after you graduate, and you will see yourself actually get confused a lot about this. Gradient descent is not about the function's output. It's about loss function, which is j, right? Or l, people use l. And W can be theta too, by the way, sorry. So this can be um, theta. Sorry, actually I made a mistake. This is not X. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that was what I was trying to say. It's not X and Y in getting descent. I made a really stupid mistake here too, right? See how you make that mistake. So it's not X. It should be theta. Okay, X and Y are the input and output of the function. You got it? So now then you're starting from A0 and then you're looking at this function, right? And you know that this function has some convex shape, which means, oh, it has some downhill. And you know that if you go downhill, probably your loss function will be smaller, right? So you compute the, the, the slope here and then you just move a little bit downward. And by, if you have done some, if you have taken some class in real analysis, or you have done some serious math when you're doing calculus, then you know that by definition, there exists basically an epsilon value that you can move really small value and then you can decrease by delta of your loss function. So it's guaranteed that if you can move really small to the left here, then you can guarantee that even if you don't know what the function looks like, you can guarantee your loss function will go down. So you're at the current A0 and you want to move a bit, right? And you want to get to A1. And how you get to A1 is exactly you, the equation you see on the right. So A1 a, or AM plus one will be equal to AM minus, AN is a starting point or the previous point. And you move by a very small amount of the slope and the slope is this gradient, right? So hopefully you have done some multivariate calculus. That means that you're computing gradient of this function. I'm sorry, so the notations are mixed up. So this F is equivalent to here, uh, actually J. Sorry, so I got this equation from Wikipedia, but image from another source. So, but it will help you hopefully to understand that the people use like so many different notations to say the same thing, but here, the F is actually the loss function, J or L. So you compute the gradient of the, the current function, current loss function, and then you move by just a little bit, which is this um, value, the gamma value. And this can be very small. Like for instance, it came back 0 0.001. If you move really small, then the good thing is that you will probably not overshoot. What it, might, what it means by overshoot is that if you have this slope and let's say that you want to go down so quickly that maybe you want to move like up to here. But now you see that if you move up to like here, then you will actually have higher loss, right? So you don't want to move too much. That's the point. You want to move a small bit. No one knows what that small number will be. So you people usually set to a certain number initially and then they adjust it sometimes, or some, of course, simplest case, you just fix it to some number and that works fine too in many cases too. But that's the, uh, how you would optimize. It's more of optimization theory than the, uh, the theory behind how you do the gradient descent. So you do this iteratively, hoping that someday you will get to this global minimum 
So maybe you're here and then you're here, then maybe you're here, 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 and here. Maybe you get there by uh, 10th step after 10 steps of this gradient descent. So that's great, but now you see a big problem here, right? Because how can you guarantee that you will go to global minimum if the function is not convex? Because um, I'll just give you a heads up, the functions that you'll be dealing with in your life or when you're doing deep learning will never be convex. If it's convex, then probably there is anyway an analytical solution in many cases. So you don't really have to use gradient descent. And the, way, the reason why you wanna use gradient descent is because the function is not convex and it's complicated. But now there is a, this irony that if it's not convex, then we're not guaranteed that we'll be reaching global minimum. We are only guaranteed that we'll be reaching local minimum, but no one knows if this function looks like something like this, right? What if you wanna get here, but you get here? Uh, what if you uh, wanna get here, but you get here. That's bad, right? I mean, at least in terms of trying to minimize loss function. So historically, this is actually why people thought that gradient descent will not work on complex functions like what we discussed that has, you know, tangents and tangent 10 H and these nonlinearities and several layers of neural nets. Several layers of neural nets is not convex, it's nonlinear. So, uh, there is, people thought that there is no way to optimize this well. There is no theory to optimize it. But the funny thing is that you will also encounter this a lot when you're doing programming or anything related to deep learning is that the theoretical nature is not super sometimes coherent with the theoretical nature. So yes, it looks like that there is no guarantee that you will go to good value, but in many cases, you'll reach a good minimum that might not be global minimum, but it's a good minimum that's good enough so that you can do your job. And another important thing is that it's really one more important thing. Although your optimization function is trying to minimize the loss function, please note that your training data is not the entire population. What that means is you have a limited number of training data. So when you're trying to maximize your loss, minimize your loss function, you are just trying to minimize loss function on that training data, not the entire population samples. So it's the, your global minimum may not be a generalized minimum or which means it may have overfit. So this is another important part because it's not always the case that global minimum is the, the, the best answer for your your application that the model you're trying to learn. So maybe it's better to stay in more of a local minimum than global minimum to find a good model. So, but these are more of a very empirical evidences than any more theoretical things. And that's where your intuition comes in and where that's really important. So uh, please keep that in mind. So I spent um, a lot of time talking about gradient descent, which I thought is really important. So uh, ho hopefully that's, was, uh, that was, helpful for some of you. Probably it's very, maybe not super new for many of you, but so now here's the, um, the important parts. So gradient descent is likely to converge to a local minimum if the gamma value is small enough. So I talked about that, but if the loss function is convex then there is only one local minimum, right? So, which is the global minimum. So there's no problem, but if the function is not convex then which is the case for the most deep neural networks then there is a mathematical guarantee that, but it empirically works well. And I wanna add two more things. Um, so modern neural net training are very dependent on gradient descent. And they uh, more specifically there are two variants that you need to be really aware of. One is that you are being stochastic instead of a full gradient descent. What that means is that gradient descent by definition means that you want to define loss function on top of the entire training data. But that is not so desired in many cases. Number one is because you're trying to use the super large training data as input, which is very inefficient. So if you're talking about like 1 million data, then your 1 million data will be in the function 
that you're trying to optimize, which is very probably slow, right? And also, so you want also want to inject some uh, stochastic nature. So that's why we use stochastic gradient descent, which is just basically you just, instead of using the entire training data, you just sample, say like uh, 16 examples or 32 examples from the million training examples when you're trying to compute the gradient descent gradients and then just do the descent with those sampled examples. So you probably heard of like mini batches, right? Hopefully that's relevant to this. So technically, uh, mini batch corresponds to stochastic gradient descent, and when you say batch, it actually corresponds to the full gradient descent. But I think nowadays people actually intermix those two um, terms. I mean, they use batch for the mini batch too. So don't be confused if you encounter that when you're uh, reading a paper. Another interesting um, observation about this is for those of you who are really familiar with um, pretty language models like BERT. So it was believed for a long time, especially that's what Jan Lukun actually insisted is that stochastic gradient descent, it's much more powerful than gradient descent, not just in terms of efficiency, but it's very required so that it can, we, we can prevent the model being overfitting into the, to the uh, training data. So that was the belief. So for many years after even deep learning, I think probably until like, I think BERT, to be honest, until the introduction of BERT or maybe um, GPT-1, people thought that, oh, you, you, can, you should never go over batch, mini batch size of 32. There's no reason to do that. You always have to stay under that. And then uh, starting with the uh, BERT and followed by many other pre-trained language models, it is actually now believed that that's not true. And in many cases, actually increasing the mini batch size, which means going near the full gradient descent instead of stochastic gradient descent is more advantageous if the computational efficiency is, of course, is not an issue. So that's why we're seeing like crazy number of batch sizes. For instance, there was a model that used something like 10,000, 100,000 batch size, mini batch size to make it converge really fast for language models. So now you might wonder why is that case then nowadays we are moving more towards gradient descent, full gradient descent, but in in in, in, the, in the past it was more about stochastic. And the reason uh, many people think is that basically that depends on the data set size and also model size. So if those two grow a lot, then it looks like we also want to grow the batch size too. But then if those two are small enough, if the model size is small enough, and also the, uh, the, the, the data set size, entire training data set size is small enough, then we want to stay in the more of a small mini batch size, stay like 32. So it's something that uh, hopefully makes you, if you were more familiar with recent work, then hopefully that connects you with the uh, more historic, historic, you know, discoveries of historic part, I think more of the, those things that are not super valued anymore, but it actually now people think that way. And number two is that modern optimizers are equipped with momentum. So things like atom optimizer. So what that means is I'll give you just really quick overview. It's really simple thing, actually. It's very intuitive. So let's say that we were trying to optimize over this function. And let's say we started from here. Then is there no way that we can get here? If we use stochastic gradient descent with very small gamma, then there is no way because probably we'll be going like here, going here, and going here, and going here, and just stay here, right? But you can think of this as more of a really physical world that you have a ball here and let's say you just drop it so that it basically just goes down. Then there is a momentum that this ball will not just right away stop here, right? It will probably go like here and then maybe go here. And then of course, because of the um, energy function, it will not probably go over the point that it has started, but Maybe because this point is lower than the starting point, maybe this will just tip over the hill and then 
you know, go to the, the next valley, right? So that's the, exactly the point of momentum that giving the ball a momentum to overcome a small, relatively small hill so that it may be able to go to a better optimum or lower minima. So there is a math behind this, but the overall idea is like that. Okay, so yeah, I think I spent too much time on a lot of uh, basics. Maybe I should have planned that ahead, my bad. But I'll try to go over back propagation and hopefully because the assignment will have some component about the exploding and vanishing gradients, hopefully you can learn about these things in the, during the, up through the assignments. And I'll try to upload some I don't know, probably some material to actually explain this to you. But back propagation is an important thing again in deep neural nets in this class. So I'll explain what that means. So, so now we have a good idea that we have to compute a gradient. All right. Uh, I'll just have a really quick rest, quick break, one minute break, so that I can just um, get my voice. Um, so yeah, uh, so just one minute break, okay? So I'll come back really soon. I'll just get water now and talk about backpropagation. And lastly, I'll talk about uh, briefly about LSTMs. I wanted to go to Jupiter to talk about how we can implement these things, but I think we don't have time for that. So I'll upload the Jupiter notebook for your reference too. One minute break. All right, so let's go back to backprop. So what is backpropagation? So I think I wanted to also cover this because many of you who have who have um, recently started deep learning probably can enjoy the, um, the, the automatic gradient computation and all the training routines already built for you. So, I think, but I think it's important for you to understand what's really happening inside, especially for the recurrent neural net, because that's exactly where the bottlenecks of RNNs come in. So here's the motivation. So what before going into backpropagation, I want to first mention that again, what we said is we want to find a theta that maximizes the power distribution, right? Or in other words, we want to max, minimize loss function. So we have this loss function, suppose, and I'll just use one example for now because it will be exactly the same for many examples. So we use, you remember this log probability of y being y given x equal, actually the other way, 
theta and x equal x, right? And we want to find a theta that minimizes this, this value. And suppose uh, I'll, model, I'll, I'll use a model for tax classification and I'll be using RNN. So here, remember this simple RNN with 10H. We have X1, X2, X3, X4. So we're talking about single example. So this entire thing can be considered as X, right? So we have a single example of X and we have tokenized the text into four tokens and we have done some embedding. So these are actually vectors. And then these are going into this recurrent neural net model with weight to be consistent with the previous one, I think. This was you, I think. Let me just check really quickly. You, right? And what's coming from the previous hidden state is V. And we use 10H for the for non nonlinearity activation. And we'll be using the final hidden state and we'll be going through one, one layer of neural net followed by softmax. So what does that mean mathematically? So we're, we're gonna define probably distribution of y being y given theta x equal x as, here's the important thing, we're gonna use, let's say this is W. So we're gonna use W of H4 and we're gonna apply softmax over this double H plus four, H4. And note that we don't really need, uh, actually I'll put the uh, bias here too. But Suppose just for simplicity, this bias is not super important. So let's just assume that bias is there, but it's not super important at the moment. So I th up to now, hopefully you get the point that this softmax will be a valued probabilistic distribution. Here, of course, W is, we are trying to map the H4, which is, let's say it's dimensional BD and mapping that to two, two, two dimensions, we're doing text classification of positive and negative. So it will be two times D, right? And B will be all, also two times one. Okay, then if we want to compute the gradient that we want to perform, we want to perform the um, differentiation, right? So. Let's say this is just for simplicity p. Actually, no, never mind. My bad. I think that will just confuse more. I'll not interest in new notation. So we know that this is L, right? So uh, we define this to be L. So, or loss. So L is same thing as we saw J or other notations, right? But let's use L here. So what we want to compute is that we want to compute the gradient, which means we want to compute the partial differentiation of L over some theta values, right? And here we're talking about all different parameters, but we'll be fixing this to one parameter, which will be U. And suppose that the U is just scalar so that we are we can do everything pretty easily. You can use actually a matrix, right? But then suppose this is scalar value, right? Because we can operate in single dimensional space too. We are assuming D equal to some positive number, but D can be equal to one. So we're assuming D equal one, then U is scalar. 
So let's say we were trying to compute this differentiation, this derivative. Then if you go into this, then this will be basically differentiating the softmax and then it will be basically we have chain rule, right? Plus we're going inside the H4. We know that the W and B will be constant with respect to you, right? So we don't have to worry about differentiating W and B. We want to be computing derivative H4. So it, it's chain rule. I hope you remember all these from your calculus class. So this will be not plus, sorry, times, right? Times H4 over got dot, no, what do you call? Uh, D over H4 over DU, right? Partial D. So now you have this, and now you have to compute H4 over uh, U. My writing is not good. And partial differentiation H4 over H U, it's U is because remember that H4 is exactly tan H of U, uh, U times X x3, x4, plus v times x, uh, not x, sorry, h3 plus some bias, right? So if you do the derivative, then this will be, again, wait, The chain rule again, right? Chain rule. So just a second. Sorry, so I made this all <laughs> always make mistake. So, so this chain rule because it's it'd be H4, right? Sorry, that's not you. So this gets canceled out, right? This gets canceled out. So softmax over h4 and then h4 over u that's a chain rule so similarly we want to use chain rule to get the uh this entire function over d of i'll say h3 times h3 dh3 over du. So now you get the point right here. So the, the way that we're gonna compute this entire gradient is that exactly, we wanna start from the, the t equal four. And after that, you wanna compute the gradient one by one, right? So you have computed first this, if you wanna compute dl of du, you have to compute dh4 of du. And then if you want to compute d4 of d, d, dh4 of du, then you have to compute dh3 of du and so on. So that that's exactly the reason why, how the chain rule works, right? But as you see, there is a, a so what the back propagation really means is that because you have to compute all these values, you don't want to compute this um, basically two times, right? So you can basically obtain a lot of these numbers when you are computing a Ford. So there's where the efficiency comes in. And, but I don't wanna go into that details today because I think I'm running out of time. I wanted to go into LSTM at least, but okay, I admit that I failed to manage my time well, but you get the point that we can actually compute the gradient through the chain rule. And hopefully you will uh, more details learn why backpropagation really matters a lot because of the efficiency issues. And it's actually, it's a very important because if you don't use backpropagation, if you don't store these values, gradients, in intermediate gradients, then you will see that your computing a gradient at the end will be really costly. It will be basically, you have to compute the gradient every time. So 
it's important that you actually store these gradients, intermediate gradients, so that you can have a propagation efficient. But mathematically, basically, this is how you would compute the, the gradient for every time step. It's so nice that now we have a good tool to compute the gradient. OK, so I told you this, this will be on the assignment. So I'll be skipping this. But I'll be briefly talking about that, the fact that it's really RNNs, um, when you're computing gradients in RNNs, you will be either exploding or vanishing those gradients. It will be getting very small or very large at the end. And that's very bad because there are two things that's bad. One is that if gradient is small, that means that even if you are giving some loss at, at, the, um, at the time step, the final time step. So in this case, you saw the text classification happens at t equal four because the h4 is dependent on all the previous time steps, right? So it makes sense to use this h4 for the final classification. But whatever you do, whatever you uh, you try to give a loss, uh, some update to, that gradient will not properly flow through very distant time. So the loss will not be very I would say sensitive to what you have done in time step one because it's so far away. That's the, exactly the point of uh, the vanishing gradient problem. How about the exploding gradient problem? It's the other way actually. The gradient becomes so big that it just explodes everything and it, it can overflow. So that's the two problems in RNNs. And that's, that's really the problem in RNNs. But another really important point here is that also you have really hard time encoding the long time dependency because whatever you had initially will be always transformed with your new matrix, right? Your transformation matrix, with which was V, right? You, you remember this V? And this V always transform the entire information. So although RNN has, um, they, it's, it's theoretically possible to convey the information from the earlier time steps to later time steps. This V basically just disturbs everything that in many cases, it's really hard to convey some information over a long period of time. It's called um, long-term dependency problem. I'll just write that down. Plus, so that's exactly why we need something like LSTM that many of you probably are aware of. So, and GRU. And to add one more thing, even then, even the LSTM or GRU, they are not super good at long-term dependency. So what have people done after that is adding a tension mechanism. So we'll get to this, but this will not be the scope of the, 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 the assignment though. So don't worry about that if you're, when you're doing assignments. In the assignment, you'll be just be asked to um, implement LSTM. I was actually originally gonna do a break here, but apparently I messed up. So let me just try to explain how the LSTM works really briefly. And hopefully I can do some recap next lecture so that, or do more explanation next lecture so that you don't have much problem doing the assignment. So it looks really complex compared to RNN, but actually if you dissect one by one, it's actually quite simple. So that's what I'm gonna to do today. So this is familiar, right? So this is RNN. This output thing, you can just think of it as the, the last thing that you do for the classification. Remember that what you have applied to H4 to do the classification, that's this part, this output part, you can think of it as. Okay, so that's great. And then what L, how the LSTM works is, so I'll actually go the other ways that I'll try to define what HT is. So starting from here. Actually, no, I'll go the four way here this way. All right, so the first thing you have to really be aware of is in fact, this value. It's actually ironic that 
um, you know, these days, even if I actually talk about these, many of you will not probably use LSTM maybe for uh, most of your applications, but still, I think it's worth talking about that, learning the history, right? So this is what's really equivalent to RNN. That's how you should really interpret it. C tilde T is very equivalent to the how the RNN works. But you will have a few components on top of this. And there are several things. Number one, you actually compute what's called gate. And gate is just the value between zero and one. So what, what happens if gate is uh, one? Then probably means that you are actually passing everything from the previous time step because gate is open, right? So that's what the um, each gate does. So you have a forget gate. It's F is corresponding to forget gate. This is forget gate. And when you have forget gate that's equal to one, then you will see that it basically affects here, right? That FT here. And what if this is one? Then you are just saying that current C of T is just equivalent to C of T minus one. So you get why this is called gate, right? Because if you have 1.0 gate, then you just don't block anything from the pre previous time step. You just follow everything. And you also have the um, input gate, which is controlling how much you want to flow the information from the, the vanilla RNN information, which is this. I'll use actually different color. This is equivalent to this, right? So here, if it equal to 1.0, it means that you're gonna use the current time steps RNN out output or RNN hidden state fully. But what if this is zero? Then you're just ignoring the current RNN's output entirely. And you're just using the previous hidden state value as your current hidden state. So you just basically just copy and paste the previous hidden state. And lastly, there is something called output gate. And it's something that actually, if you go to, um, I would say, GRU, these things are a bit different, but I, I'll just explain what that means. As you see, your output gate is controlled here. So your output gate basically decides whether whatever you have have computed up to now, are you gonna actually use that or not at all? But remember that these gates are not scalar gates, they are gate per dimension. So it's not like you have one scalar to control everything. You have a different gate for different dimension. So the point here is that maybe for some dimension you'll be forgetting, which means if T will be zero, so you actually don't flow anything from, from the previous time step. But for, for some dimension you're copying from previous time steps, hopefully you can utilize this efficiently so that you can get your work done at the current time step. But as you see, the really core difference is that because it might be confusing, that's why. Here, the hidden state is not dependent on previous hidden state. What's being dependent at each time step is CT, not HT. So that's the uh, core difference. And uh, hopefully you don't get confused with that um, because what the, the really hidden state here is more of a CT. That's why um, people sometimes get confused. So that's the major difference between RNN. So that's called gating mechanism. Okay. So it's pretty simple, right? I mean, you just basically gate different things. Other than that, it's very similar to RNN. And how you compute gate values is exactly similar to how you'd compute RNN. So it depends on current input and previous time steps hidden state. But okay, yeah. So okay, so yeah, that's the that's the that's the part. So that uh, that's how you compute the hidden state. And then I think. That's it for today. I'm um, sorry, so I went over by two minutes, but 
if you have questions, please use GitHub issues, GitHub discussions, or please um, use the office hours. The assignment will be based on these materials that we discussed up to now, lecture four. So hopefully you enjoy it. It will be out tonight. All right, so I'll see you on Wednesday.